Great day, everyone, at Dudley. Yeah, I'm still in Durham. Um, can't wait to get out of here to go record somewhere else. But until then, I am hanging out in the Mbutu house with amazing individual that I call my only girlfriend. She cannot call me her only boyfriend. And it's been proven multiple times every time we do a show with a gentleman on. But I digress. Miss Charmaine Super Money, how you doing today? I'm fabulous, my Zulu Ed. Um, I can't help us if I have these amazing individuals in my life that are doing good work. So yes, you are my special boyfriend, but there's so many other good gentlemen that's doing great work. So I have to confess, I have a whole lot of them. And can I say I'm so excited to bring another one into the Ubuntu oh. house? Because he's humble. He has a beautiful soul and he does, although he has a diverse portfolio, he makes mm -hmm. time for humanity. And Love that it. speaks volumes about the type of leaders we need to have. So yes, I'm going to say he is my boyfriend. He doesn't realize it now. So he doesn't, um, so well, he didn't know. So let's, let's bring in your, new, <laughs> let's go ahead and bring in your newest boyfriend. Um, hello Ziad, um, Charmaine's newest boyfriend that you didn't even know. How are you doing, sir? Hi, good afternoon. I'm doing well. How's everybody? We all, we all great though. He he is he is my he's been my boyfriend for a while actually. But we, in so terms of the way you've him? been teasing me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Silliman, do you see what I have to put up with, right? This harassment. But you know, I just love his energy and he's and he's a good hearted man, so I'm gonna put up with it. Um <laughs> And I can't wait to share, if I may, Ed, mm -hmm. as to why we, I actually invited Ziad to, to join us today yes, and, and, and demonstrate as to what he does and the impact he has on individuals, in communities, in his business, and actually for the country as a whole in many respects, having quite a diverse portfolio. Ziad and I actually met through an individual that we both mentored and he gave resources to. Um, to help him grow his business and have a desired impact. So that's how we met a few years ago. Um, he doesn't do things for the photo op, like photo opportunity, like some leaders. Um, humble, kind, a good human being. So Mr. Silliman, Ziad, my new boyfriend, according to Ed Dudley. <laughs> it's recorded, Charmaine. It's recorded. We, got the, we can roll a tape back and he said, my new boyfriend. He is my, he's my boyfriend, but my new boyfriend. He's like, a, okay, let's drop this. Mr. S Ziad, so happy to have you with the Ubuntu house. <laughs> and you have an amazing portfolio on many levels. I just want to ask you just one question as to how do you manage being a great dad, a, fr a good friend to most, a mentor, um, the other diverse portfolios that you actually do, in addition to your full-time job, how do you manage all of that? And what keeps you going to accomplish what you do and what you achieve? Well, firstly, thanks very much for the opportunity. I mean, really nice to chat to you guys this afternoon and to share some thoughts and hopefully learnings that we can both take some good things away from, right? Um, yeah, for me, I think it's really all around being genuine, being who you are, you know, I think helping people, being good at your work, being disciplined, having the right values is all that we have, you know, and ultimately it's what makes each of us up on. And ultimately, you know, to try and get the right balance, obviously there is a big requirement on discipline, big requirement on a good work ethic, a big requirement on prioritizing what's important. And yes, I use the word prioritizing because in today's world of complexity, everything is important, but it's also trying to put things into different buckets, right? Your family are as important, if not more important than your work. You know, your sport and your health is important as it is your family. And so are so many other things, you know, and you spoke about leadership in your opening, equally where you have the skills and you've learned and you've benefited from learning from other people, you also have that responsibility to give back and to support other people. So there are multiple buckets and multiple facets to life, which is not just centered around you. It's centered around you, centered around your work, centered around the community, the people, the country, the broader ecosystem. 
And that's really the way we got to think, right? Not just as leaders, but as people. And I think if we have that in mind with the genuineness that I spoke about earlier, then we in an authentic relationship, in an authentic discussion, and in things that are looking for the best outcome, regardless of whichever bucket you're playing in. I absolutely that love that. That was an opening. That was just, <laughs> that was an opening. All right, we can drop the mic and we can shut down and just let that land and sit with everybody out there from the from the C-suite all the way down to I don't care if you're a janitor. So that was absolutely amazing. So for you know, I had a chance to look a little bit about your background and take a look at your CV. Absolutely amazing. But I would love for you to share for our individuals that don't know you. Um, whether it's they're coming from the States, the UK, Hong Kong, that don't know you, tell us a little bit about who you are, um, whether it's corporate, whether it's personal, uh, whatever you'd like to share with us. Okay, so thanks very much. Yeah, so born and brought up in South Africa, in Johannesburg to be specific. I had the absolute privilege of going to one of the very best schools in South Africa, a school by the name of St. John's College. And for all of that education, I have the highest praise and the highest owing to my parents, right? Who sacrificed everything in their lives in order to give me that level of education. And pretty much when I talk about sacrifice in my life, I don't think I've seen something bigger. So essentially giving up everything, you know, in order to make sure that somebody like myself had that opportunity. So upon that premise of knowing that you are coming from humble beginnings, you know, you have to work hard. You have to make this work. And ultimately, this is the path for the future. You have an ingrained uh, position within your soul that says you have to succeed. You have to work hard. You cannot let people down because so much has been placed on your shoulders, not as an obligation or as a responsibility, but as hope. You know, mm. fast forward through school, I went and studied uh, law. You know, I always had a passion for law even whilst growing up. And I did pretty well at university. I came top at university. And as a result of coming top in my undergraduate studies, I then was very fortunate that I got my articles at one of the top law firms, where I also, in, a, in addition to serving my articles, I also did my second degree, which is a postgraduate honors in law, which would normally take two years, but the university allowed me to do it in a year because of my prior good results, right? So Come the end of my law school, as well as, you know, my serving my articles, you know, then I had the opportunity of staying in practice for a short while, but equally moving into the commercial world. So pause on that and I'll come back to the professional life just now. When I went to study, you know, because I always love sport, and I mean, you can see my background, I've got a cricket bat, some golf clubs, all of these things as part of my ambiance, you know. <laughs> Because I really love sport, you know, the South African coach asked me at one point, you know, why are you not playing hockey? What are you involved in? All of those types of things. And I said, listen, I really have to focus on my studies. And the reason why you'll understand this is because of the sacrifice that comes from before, you know, so I wanted to focus on that. I really had to do well at that. And in life, you have to be quite focused in how you're going to achieve things. You can't be all things to all people. But at the same time, you can certainly be focused and be good in the areas that you play. Yeah. So, you know, I joined uh, KwaZulu Natal Hockey. I coached the Natal Junior team, which is one of the provincial teams. I was the youngest director at the age of 19 on the board. And at 20 years old, I was the chairman of the board. You know, so those were all experiences. And the reason why I share that with you is because to anybody listening out there, I want to really make the statement that age doesn't define you, but your experience and the way you think, you know, and your yearning to take advantage of opportunities that are thrown at you is what defines you. And that is at that point in my life, you know, at 20 years old, to take on these responsibilities, I set up my own business while at university, running a sports academy, and all of those things teach you lessons which you can never find off the shelf. You know, because they life lessons, they're dealing with people, they're understanding relationships, they're thinking about commerce, they're thinking about multiple facets of life. Anyway, after that, you know, I then decided to come back to Johannesburg 
And I was very fortunate that my first position was as a cons consultant. I was setting up what we called at the time the SNO, the second network operator, which is uh, the competition to the fixed line telephony company called Telcom. And in that role, my job was really around commercial, property, legal, being an advisor, right? That allowed me to grow. Fast forward from there, I then went and was a senior legal counsel at Business Connection, which is one of the large ICT companies in South Africa. And then the big blue came calling, right? So I, I then had a fantastic opportunity for which I'll ever be grateful to join IBM. I was headhunted to be a senior legal counsel. Six months later, the gentleman that hired me said, I'm off back to the UK. And I said, what do you mean? You just hired me. And he said, no, I've been here for three years and I've been looking for the person to take my job. And now I've found the person. So I feel comfortable that I, my job is done. I can go back, right? And uh, off I went. I took on being the head of legal for the region. And then we grew into Africa and I took on that opportunity. And beyond that, you know, I've always stayed connected to multiple other things outside of just work. So, you know, I've served on uh, as a non-executive director on a couple of boards. I've helped a lot of NGOs. I've always been intertwined in industry associations, all of those types of things in parallel to your general work. So, you know, you've got your family. Charmaine, you were speaking earlier around, you know, family, you know, professional life, you've got your sport, you've got all of these different things that you've got to bring together. But there's nothing wrong with allowing them all to run in parallel streams, right? And manage them because it's all about management. How do you manage your time? How do you get an effective outcome? How do you ultimately influence and allow positive influence to come onto you? You know, and how do you grow and learn so that you're not staying static, you know? Because the world is dynamic. As soon as you're standing alone and you're bored and you think you're not contributing, then I think that's enough of a message to yourself that you need to do something, right? And part of that meant that, you know, after seven years at IBM, being the head of legal, you know, I was offered a great opportunity to move to Dubai on an assignment to run Middle East Pakistan. And thereafter, as soon as I was on virtually on the plane to do that, the general manager for Middle East and Africa called me and said, Ziad, listen, you know, I think we're making a mistake. We need you more in South Africa, which is one of our biggest regions. We want to create a job which we don't have today, which is called Chief Operating Officer for the Sub-Saharan African region. And I don't have a job spec, but I know the areas of responsibility I want to give you. So I'm going to give it to you and you'll sort it out type of thing, right? <laughs> and again, you know, moving out of your comfort zone, just taking on the opportunity, backing yourself, being positive, being solution-minded is what takes you forward, you know? So that's how I ended up with IBM, right? First uh, portion of my career at IBM as the head, head of legal, second portion as the chief operating officer for the Africa region. And then one year ago, you know, I had the privilege of being called again and asked whether I'd like to join a true South African company called EOH, a company that's really been through a tough time in terms of legacy and, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, mismanagement and those types of things. And when Stephen van Kolle came calling and said, listen, you are a true South Africa, you're a person, you know, as a true South African, this is a true South African company that needs your skills and help. We are a JSC stock listed company. You know, we are looking to transform our business to move from EOH 1.0 to 2.0. What about being the group chief commercial officer, you know? And again, you know, certainly not afraid of taking on a challenge, backing yourself. And off I went, you know, and today I pretty much run the whole go-to-market. I'm very much part of the strategy around our client base, our customers, you know, how we go to market, what our market presence is, all of those types of ambits of making sure that it's a sustainable business. So sure. I'm, I'm going to pause there because I've also got a lot to talk about in terms of the other work that I do, but uh, let me pause. I, I just want to make a comment. I was wondering, Ziad, when you took that position, like, what was Ziad thinking? But now with that background and context, it all makes sense to me. So thank you for sharing. Continue, so, actually. You have, you so I, no, I just I just got a quick question. Because, uh, so over here in the States, 
And you hear about hockey. Hockey's big here. Hockey's big in Europe. I don't think I've ever really heard about hockey in Africa. What got you into <laughs> hockey? <laughs> So this is a different type of hockey. So it, as you'd imagine, I've been, I've, I've spent many, many times in the U.S. and I've watched and Canada and I've watched a lot of the ice hockey, okay. which is generally the hockey that you refer to. All right, okay, so all right. the, the hockey, the hockey that we refer to is more field hockey, which is more associated with, you know, Australia, the Netherlands, wow. those types of countries. So it is, it is a form of hockey, except you don't have ice underneath your feet, you know. Yeah, so I was, I was pitching, I was pitching people from Africa running around on ice with their with their stick <laughs> in hockey, and I just I just couldn't do it. So that's why I had to ask that question. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. And good question. Just to clarify, yeah, continue, Ziad. I mean, you have so much to share. I'd like to hear about the next chapter of what you're currently doing to help, you know, help South Africans as well as your international exposure and the impact you're having. Yeah, sure. So, you know, earlier I spoke about doing multiple streams in parallel. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I do is I serve as the South African chair of 4IR in the digital economy at BRICS, you know, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It's that entire union. And then I also serve on two presidential commissions, the one around digital skills. And the purpose of the digital skills uh, framework is really around building up the skills that can meet economic demand where we you know where the economic demand is producing the skills to match the demand which then in turn means that you ultimately grow the fiscus but you reduce unemployment and you allow people to become far more meaningful in their lives right because you're helping them towards a purpose part of the problem throughout the world is we think that we're just going to produce skills but if you're producing skills in a vacuum it's a problem because those people go into a market that's saturated and then they lose hope right so mm -hmm. it's very important for us as leaders to have a strategic plan that's executable so what we're doing in south africa is we're looking at the market especially with the advent of uh, digital transformation and the way the world is going more and more digital and saying well what type of skills are required in this market are they application developers are they uh, robotics experts are they, uh, you know, people that need to be skilled in cloud, all of those types of things. And for our young people, we are working with corporates in order to understand and create the demand and thereafter on the back end train so that when those people come off, there is already a demand of where they could be pushed into, right? So you're creating promise, you're creating, you know, a great future and a great opportunity for people but it's meeting the expectations of companies, of the country, and ultimately it's progressive. So that's the one piece of work outside of my professional duties, right? The other portion of uh, the work is around what we call the PPGI, which is the Public Private Growth Initiative. And this is really around fostering growth for the country between the public sector and the private sector, because it is a multifaceted world, let alone country. And if you don't have the public domain working with the private domain, you don't have harmony. The public sector can't do everything on their own. The private sector is very reliant on the public sector. And therefore, it's like everyday life, you know. We're all interdependent on each other, whether you like it or not, right? You need the train driver to pitch up at work in order for you to go to work. Sure. You, need, you need somebody to be working at the refinery in order to make sure that you get your fuel to the filling station so that you can fill up your tank. And you need the baker to pitch up at work in order to do his kneading of the dough in order to prepare the bread so that you can have the convenience of going into a store in order to buy that, right? Those are the ease of efficiencies which we take for granted. And that's why this harmonious relationship, you know, between all different sectors of society and people you know, has got to be respected. And it's easy, it's easy to be philosophical about these things. But the reality is that if we just tackle these types of things in a respectable, professional manner, to a large extent, I think a lot could be solved. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm so with you on it. I mean, I'm always fascinated by what the projects that you get involved in. And, sometimes, and, and most of these projects that he's mentioning is voluntary. You don't get paid for it. But he makes time to be able to influence 
um, and make a difference to the youth, especially um, Ed, just for your information. I mean, and see, I could talk to the numbers. The unemployment rate for our youth, and youth is classified for anybody under the age of 35, is sitting at around 60%. Do you see the projects that you're working on, Ziad? Um, it, it's going to have an effect and, and, and a positive impact, but the time frame within the that we're going to actually see results. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? As to Sure. I mean, we're already seeing results, right? So it's not something that you say we're going to put in a plan and hopefully in three years' time we'll start seeing a result. The world mm -hmm. and society doesn't wait for that. The country can't afford that, right? Sure. But what we have to do as leaders is it's almost as though, though you've got to change the tire while the bus is moving, right? And that's the way you have to think in that's today's the urgency, world. Yeah. Today's, today's world is about agility. It's about solving practical problems while things are moving, right? But making it better as you move along. So to answer your question directly, I mean, we already have multiple programs that are already delivering results. But the issue is in order for it to be really magnified, you need the scale. And in order to get the scale, you have to have evangelists and people that believe and people that are prepared to invest and people that are prepared to walk that journey with you. And I must tell you, we are very, very pleased that most, you know, C-level executives, most people we speak to, whether they be in the private sector or the public sector, are very supportive. So if I give you an example, I mean, you know, in the PPGI, we have the five core ministries related to digital in the public sector, including the DTI, the Department of Communications, you know, Department of Education and a couple of others all residing under the presidency. So the presidency represents that piece. And then on the public, on the private sector side, we've got five senior leaders, myself representing ICT. We've got somebody, you know, Vukani who represents, who's the CEO of Accenture. We've got somebody from uh, Software AG. We've got uh, a director from Yellowwoods, who's the investment company. We've got uh, Evan, who's the COO at, uh, and strategy person at Harambi all chaired by Mte Toniati, right, who is a, a great leader in this country, coming together and having these discussions. So I think this shows you the belief of intertwining, you know, the objective and then delivery. So we are seeing results. What we are really focused on is how do we scale it, right? It's not about even 10 times. It's really times 100, times 1,000, times 2,000, because that's the need, you know, Wow. Oh, that's awesome. And do you have a question? No, that was, that was, that was interesting. Um, I, I love all that, all that work. Sherman, I'll let you go ahead and ask your question that you're going to ask. I know. I'm just impressed with the, the level of um, commitment and delivery that you speak to. And I think some of the things that are actually happening in the background is not really communicated to, to people out there. So I'm so glad that you're taking the time to actually share what's actually happening and in the process, igniting some level of hope because the reality is people on the ground are needing leaders like yourself to be able to lead effectively and create that promise, but more importantly, the promise of the job and the skill. Um, Siad, is there something else that, I, you, you see, I'm, I'm ready to ask questions, but I don't want to digress from all the stuff that you can actually share with the community and any sort of, contacts or relationships or platforms that they could even access would be useful as well. Yeah. I think the one thing, I mean, that, that I do want to share is the fact that in life today is not the responsibility of a single person to make sure that we're successful, right? Yeah. It's for all of us, you know, you know, often we look at countries and we think, okay, well, the president's doing a great job or a bad job. Now you just sit back and you think, are we really expecting one person to influence all those millions of people? It can't be, right? There's a whole lot of other people that ultimately decide the destiny of where we're going. And if you tilt that balance towards good and more people contributing their skill, and everybody comes with different skill, but if everybody's contributing positively, then guess what? You can only get a positive outcome. So similarly in a family, right, where you have a young child that's going to school, if they have the love, the support, the kindness, 
the tutoring, the mentoring, teaching them what is right and wrong, if that enabled by the school curriculum, then how do you think that youngster would come out in a positive way? Because that's how you're nurturing it. But the opposite is equally important, right? Is that if you do the opposite of that, then ultimately, what do you expect to be the outcome? And who has to answer that? It's not the small child. It's us as the adults and us as the leaders, right? So we Absolutely. have an innate responsibility. I mean, somebody was asking me the other day, so when you wake up in the morning, what do you think about? I think about growth for my Good business. Question. Right? I think about, mm -hmm. you know, all the responsibility of how you can make things better because that equates to sustainability. There's so many people that ride on each of our shoulders and all those other people out there. So your contribution means it has a great impact on other people. And that impact can either be at that point, but we choose for it to be either less or more. And if we choose more, I was talking about scaling just now, your impact could be times 0 0.5, or it could be times double, or you can think big and say, if I'm smart about the way I operate, it could be times 10 or times 100 or times 1,000. We all have networks. How do you leverage that? How do you get people playing to their strengths? And how do we make a difference? You know, these are the things that every single person should be grappling with, rather than people being totally individualistic, only worrying about themselves, right? Oh, you've made such a you've made so many powerful statements, and I especially love the way the statement that you actually made. Um, the, you know, I, I'm going to go back a little bit, Ziad. You are different. You think differently. You act differently. You give so much of yourself. And it, as mentioned, I've known Ziad for a while, and I've indicated just how we connected. And you don't look for the photo opportunity, and that's why I love about you, and that's why you're actually in this conversation with us, sharing actually. What, what sets you apart from some of the other leaders that I know that will never be on the Ubuntu podcast because there's no alignment on what they say, what they think, what they say, and what they do, right? Because it depends who is around, they will just pull out the nice card or say that they're doing it, but don't actually doing it. What, what is the characteristic or what, what about you makes you do what you think, what you say, and what you do, there's alignment? What sets you apart? Yeah, what you do know, you think right sets you apart? <laughs> you know, right, right at the beginning, I used the word called being genuine, right? Mm -hmm. And being authentic. And I think that's what it is, you know, is that if you're going to fool yourself, then, you know, it costs you nothing to fool other people. Because <laughs> you have to be true to yourself, right? Yeah. You know, and that's what it is, you know, your values are not different depending on your circumstances. Your values are innate, right? It's who you are. It's extremely important for us to be authentic and genuine and make sure that we show up as we are. You are who you are. Don't try and put on a facade that's misleading because that is not being authentic. It you know? comes back and bites you somewhat. People, yeah, there are too many people that, you know, have one level of values in one environment and a different level of values in another environment. And why? Who are you trying to fool, right? You're only fooling yourself. Society mm -hmm. will catch you out. People will, you know, gravitate towards you because you're a good person or otherwise, you know? So when you ask me about, you know, leadership, and I'm not here to talk about any other people, but the reality is that innate authenticity of you doing right and doing good and being true to who you are and not being scared to speak up for what is right and stand up even if you're swimming against the grain, right? I mean, there are many times where I would have sat in a boardroom through my career and, you know, people would be going in one direction, but it takes <laughs> much more to stand up and say, but uh, in a very nice way, in a respectful way, in a professional way to say, but have you thought about this, you know? What about these aspects? Is this the right outcome? Are we doing the right thing? And there's nothing wrong with the conversation. It doesn't mean you've got to be difficult about it. It doesn't mean you have to be disrespectful about it. All it means is that you have to be diplomatic in your use of your words. 
you have to be articulate in terms of getting people to understand and to open up that conversation. And those discussions have got to be constructive. You can only have a discuss uh, discussion that's constructive if you're dealing with maturity, right? Sure. And it's important for leaders to be mature, to stand up and to do the right things. Oh, that is such a part, yet another good statement that you've actually made, Ziad. Um, the environment needs to be conducive to people actually having the opportunity to speak their mind. In some instances, leaders lead with a sort of toxic attitude and people don't have the courage to be able to speak up and therefore organizations don't achieve all that they are set up or, or that they are meant to or meant to achieve actually. So that's my point that I'm making. So you're different. Um, you have a beautiful humbleness about you besides having a beautiful mind. Um, and that's how you've managed to be as productive as you are. So the point I'm making, not everybody is like you. Nobody has the, not everyone has the courage to actually speak out. So I like to say the fact that you're stating that people need to speak out, but the message to leaders is give people the opportunity to be themselves and bring different views into the boardroom and listen. You know, the other important thing is um, I often say to my team, it doesn't matter whether it's my idea, or your idea, or somebody else's idea, as long as we get the best outcome. <laughs> now, that is the important thing, right? Because what do we all want? We all want the best outcome. We all want to win. We all want to be successful. We all want, you know, the green light rather than the red light. No, so, I, I have to stop you there. You want with all your team. Not every leader has the same vision, the same desire, the same drive that you have. So it's easy for you to create that environment. And you're, as I said, you're a beautiful soul, right? With a great mind. So you create the community. I mean, you mentor, you volunteer, you do a whole lot and you give back freely, right? Not everybody is like you, Ziad. So sometimes I think you're too, what can I say, naive when you think, when you go, we all want. The goal is no, we all should want, yeah. Well, I think that's that's the point, right? We all <laughs> should want that. Yeah. And ultimately, yeah. that's what I premise my being on, right? Is yeah. doing doing good, working in the right direction, getting people to move along. And, you know, I, li I like the word that you used where you said you can't also be naive because there are times when as a leader, you cannot just be sitting back and saying, okay, well, let's all have this discussion and see how we move along. Because you also have to be, you know, true to your job and your responsibility. And there are times yeah. when you've got to be tough, right? There are going to be yeah. times when you've got to step back and say, right, listen, we've had enough of this discussion. And now ultimately, you know, part of my job is to make decisions which are tough. And I'm okay with that, right? And I'm prepared to make this decision. And now this is the route we're going. But equally with making those decisions, you don't run away from the accountability or the responsibility. So you carry that with you as the leader. So, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. So I got a question for you. You've held so many leadership positions and, you know, um, during your career. What are you most proud of as a leader? I think if I, if I, I'll, I'll split that into two, if you don't mind, Ed. Mm -hmm. you know, on the personal side, I think, uh, I'm most proud of the fact that, you know, we have a very, very good family life, stability, support, you know, good values. I've got three daughters, my wife, my parents. Okay. You know, it's a very, very good family unit. So when I look at the togetherness and when I look at my kids and their achievements, you know, I look at my, my second daughter studying second year, uh, sorry, my first daughter's studying second year medicine, my first, my second daughter studying first year become law, and then I've got a later rivals who's in grade one. And I look at their direction, happy, focused, hardworking, have achieved well, good people. You know, so as a parent, that, you know, gives me great, uh, great happiness inside me, you know, to know that you added value in your family environment and that they're doing well and that they're happy and that they are going to go forth into the world and add greater value to other people, right? And that for me is 
is a really nice thing from a personal perspective. You know, from a professional perspective, I think the fact that I've been in many, many situations which were tough situations, but we've always been able to do the turnaround, right? And I think the turnaround is part of who I am as an individual. I love a challenge, you know. If you gave me the same old thing of, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, just do the same steady thing every single day without a challenge, I think I'd get bored, right, and be looking for the next thing. So throughout my career working with multiple teams, I've always been that positive change agent for the better. You know, building people, changing around businesses, making sure that we're successful, whether it be in a project or in a division, you know, and that in itself for me gives me great gratitude because and gratification because it means that those things were not only successful, but they're sustainable, you know, and it's about compounded benefit. It's about, you know, you got something at this point, you built it up. You can now see the scaling and the compounded benefit going multifold and you leave it in a better position that you found it and in a stable way where somebody can almost just jump in and carry on driving without having to worry about whether it's roadworthy or not. So I tip my cap, I tip my cap to you, first of all, because you talked about your, your daughters in university. And then you said you had a late arrival. That's one. So when you talked about you love a challenge, God bless you. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> so God, God bless you. Um, being able to balance it all. We had a, we had another gentleman on um, and was talking as a leader, how sometimes that we've actually had a couple of people um, on as leaders talking about balancing their professional life and home life and how it was a struggle. Uh, we had one gentleman talked about, he was sitting there doing some work and then his family had bags and they were going out. It's like, wait, 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 where are you guys going? He's like, well, we're going, we're going out on a, a day trip or whatever they were going to doing. We just figured you were busy and being able to balance. And it sounds like you found that balance between your professional life and personal life where so many leaders don't, they take work home. They're working in the middle of the night and not doing all the things that they did were supposed to do with family and balancing out. And I, I should go ahead, Charmaine. Ziad works very hard, actually. He's able yeah. to balance. And I think he like, do you get enough sleep, Ziad? <laughs> uh, I think that's, one of, that's part of one of the personal sacrifices you're going to make, right? Because, <laughs> because we raise, I mean, Ed, you, you raise an important point, you know. You cannot be absent at home, you know. And, and often people speak about being present, right? The one thing that we have in our family is no matter even if it's 30 minutes late or an hour later, but we all have dinner together. And for us, that's a very important thing because it gives us all an opportunity to connect and share what's happened during the day and also solve, right? I mean, sometimes the kids will come back and say, you know, I had this today and everybody would be able to help solve and provide that level of support and comfort and, you know, just, just being connected. So, so I think that presence is very important um, but ultimately something does have to give, right? Which is where your prioritization is going to come in, you know? So I can tell you that I do work at night, right? But it's not at the sacrifice of my personal family time. Yeah. You know, so it's how you balance that. So I'll give you a practical, practical example. I mean, when I go on holiday, I try and make sure that I wake up early in the morning and get my most important and urgent things done. So by the time the family are having breakfast, I'm at the breakfast table. And for the rest of the day, unless it is something absolutely critical, I try and spend the time with them because there's no point in going on holiday with people that you love, that have been waiting to spend the time with you and then you're not present. And then in the evening, when everybody gets on after dinner to do whatever they want to do, I work again, right? So by getting that balance allows you to make sure that you're present, you're connected, but at the same time, you're not remiss of your responsibilities. Sure. What, what, what you speak to is the fact that you find a method that works best for you, not sacrificing family time. And every individual is actually different. I mean, you have the ability to wake up very early in the morning to finish off work. Well, some people can't. So you, the message to the people out there is find what works for you without sacrificing the people that are important to you in your life. Because connectivity Absolutely. also contributes to well-being. 
And if we yeah. function mentally, physically, and have the connectedness around us, it's good for both yourself as well as for your family. I mean, hats off to you to bringing your kids to the extent that you have uh, their success and all of that. It, it demonstrates you're a good leader at home as well as in the corporates, because sometimes you often find it's extremely difficult to balance that because of the sacrifices. So yeah, I, you should have more Ziads cloned, right? Because you can do these <laughs> four IR and AI things or whatever. So you can be able to spread this light and this efficiency and this what's possible to more people. So let's, oh, Ed, can we just move into the four IR space a little bit? Go ahead. <laughs> so Charmaine, I must tell you, you're very kind, right? And I'm, I'm so I'm not kind. I'm just that. honest. Yeah, thank you. But I think you know the way the way I look at it is that there are many similar, if not better, people out there, right? We just have mm -hmm. to give them an opportunity. We have to find them, and this yeah. is part of our responsibility as adults. And I'm using the word adults, right? And leaders. I'm not just mm -hmm. saying leaders. Adults and leaders, because it is up to us to try and find those people give them the right upbringing, share the right thoughts, give them the right lessons in order to make them productive, good leaders as they come off the platform, right? So anyway, off you go on to data and AI and all the other <laughs> things. No, you make <laughs> such a beautiful statement though, but just showing up for people and demonstrating that you care enough to invest in them and the fact that you see them just and like unpack so many possibilities from within though. And it does make them product. I mean, we have a few examples that we could potentially share, but we're not gonna even go there, right? As to the work that you've done in that space. So, so let's move to the 4IR aspect, right? So I know what 4IR actually means though, because thanks to Ziad, so we've had a long conversation on this because <laughs> everybody else knows I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> But yeah, so see, uh, just speak a little bit about it and where we're going and the positive impact for humans as well as country and the world, if any. I say it in tongue and cheek, but you'll speak to it more. No, absolutely. So, I mean, the world of 4IR is real, right? You know, many people, you know, think that they're not living in the world of digital transformation or technological revolutions. The reality is that it's happening every day. Mm -hmm. And you know, we cannot live without it. It's as simple as that, and I'll explain why. So, I mean, the fourth industrial revolution is really it, right? It's the fourth wave of industrial revolutions, you know, and ultimately in the, law, in the third industrial revolution, we had the advent of the internet. Mm -hmm. That basically grew over 20 years, right? Such that we got to the fourth industrial revolution in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, you know, where now all of a sudden with the opening of the World Wide Web, with people starting to utilize emails, all of these types of things, it made a number of different technological revolutions possible. So the world of 4IR is really centered around a couple of key streams. I mean, the first is around data. Everything in the world revolves around data. The way I look at it is I say it's the new natural resource because it gives you insights that people need, right? And it's, that's how it, people are differentiated, companies are differentiated, and how you move forward. And I think you've heard one of my talks before, when I speak about data, I speak about the three Vs, the volume of the data, the velocity of the data, and the variety of the data. Now, when you just think about the volume of data, just between the three of us, between your emails, between your WhatsApps, between your family, between your social media, all of those types of things that you're doing, you're already into the hundreds. Now you, you multiply it just in your family and multiply it in your community and multiply it in your country and multiply it in your continent and multiply it in your world. And that tells you how much of data is out there, right? Now, that's only volume. The variety of the data in the form of emails, texts, WhatsApps, you know, a sensor technology, you know, you utilizing your credit card when you tap at a machine, you know, all of those types of things shows you the variety, right? Mm -hmm. And then the velocity, I mean, the speed at which data transcends 
across multiple platforms shows you how integrated and converged data is. Then if you take that and put that into the world of today, AI, right, which is artificial intelligence, I like to call it augmented intelligence, augmented because we just keep building upon it, right? It's not like you're moving backwards. You augment what you've really learned and you make it better as you move along. But those insights that augmented intelligence gives you allows you to make different decisions based on your insights coming from the data. And that almost starts shaping the type of decisions that you make as you move forward. And now because of the amount of the data we have, it cannot all just continue sitting in machines that are on your shop floor or in your company, etc. And that's why you have the advent of the cloud, right? Is because people are able to take the volumes of their data and place it in another place. It's not necessarily up in the sky, but just at another location, you know, where you're able to ramp up your usage or ramp down your usage and pay for what you need. I mean, essentially, that's what the cloud is. But the cloud then comes with the security, to get, you know, which is extremely important in the world that we operate in. So when you take, I have a you know, question quickly, talking sure. about cloud, it just ignited this conversation I listened to recently. The Microsoft CEO indicated that Russia attacked Ukraine a year ago through the technology, and they were able to save it because, and and the, the attack was. Uh, was not successful because they put it in the cloud and that protected the whole thing. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. So can you speak a little bit about what that actually meant? So I gave a little bit of a snippet. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, uh, it's not just the cloud, right? I mean, these, these issues of cybersecurity incidents and hacking and phishing and all of these types of things have been around for a long time. You know, they're just different levels to it, you know? So these things happen on uh, computers and technology that's on premise, which means it's in your premises, or it could be in the cloud, right? Multiple people try to get into these types of uh, data, uh, data warehouses, into these types of processes, into your workloads, in order to derive information that then gives them an unfair advantage, which they should not be having. So yeah. these hacks can happen on-prem, they can happen towards the cloud, and that's why security is so important, right? And when you talk about the world of 4IR, security is a core component of that because we have so many intersection points. I mean, if you just think about a simple transaction of you walking into an outlet store, right? And there you go, you pick up your item, they scan it. You then place your card, you tap it. From that machine that you tap, there has to be a bridge in towards the bank, which has to verify. So there's so many intersection points at which people could target. And that's why it's important to have adequate protection at multiple layers. You know, now security has become such an interesting and, uh, and challenging environment at the same time because people are having the discussion, should I protect my network or should I protect my cloud? Should I protect on-premise? Or should I uh, protect all my applications? You know, so it's a very, very um, complex environment. And that's why the world of 4IR has given us great upside, but has also given us great challenge. But I think that's where the beauty of technology is, right? And then you have other technologies that continue, you know, things like 3D printing. Before, if you had a motor car part, you know, that ran out of stock, and it was a vintage car and you just couldn't find the part, you were in trouble, right? Because just to create a mold to go and be able to get that part was not economically feasible. Whereas today you can get the mold design and through a 3D printer, you can print it, put it into the car and it allows you to be efficient and effective in the usage of the car. That's how technology has changed the world, right? So, you know, it's... Okay, I have printing. a stupid question. No, wait, no, 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 wait before, no, before you ask your question, if you looked at Charmaine's face when you started talking about the 3D printing, and she just looks <laughs> so lost, like, wait a minute, what's going on here? What is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it happens. I didn't realize you can actually make a functioning part for a car. And how cost-effective is that? Is it? Very, 
very cost effective, right? The machine, I mean, the machine essentially, depending on the level of machine that you buy, could be everything from inexpensive to very, very uh, expensive because it's got multiple functions, etc. So it depends on whether it's for a home usage or an industrial usage or for otherwise, right? But I mean, the technology is there. You know, and it's the usage and the application of technology that's allowing human beings to solve problems. So, I mean, just think about that, right? The issue around, you know, energy saving. We all sit in a world of where, you know, we're talking about energy, right? I mean, you look at the challenge right now in Europe around gas and energy consumption, etc. You look at the challenges that we have in South Africa around, you know, electricity and load shedding and those types of things. The reality is, is that through IoT sensors, we can save electricity, right? Because when somebody walks into the room, the sensor tells you that there's activity in the room, the light comes on, which means that you're only utilizing the energy that you really need to. That's technology, you know? So there's so many ways that technology has benefited people. I mean, I, I even take you back to the time of when, you know, the mobile phone just came out, right? There were many people that said, I will never use that device. And you guys will laugh because you know you have them in your circles as well, right? But just fast forward a short while, you can't do without it, right? You do all your transactions on it. And in fact, to the point now where you actually don't even need your credit card, you just carry your mobile device, double click on the side, and you're using your credit card off your phone. I mean, this okay, I'm is not there yet because I'm like a late uh, adopter, if you want to call it. <laughs> but but yeah, it's, it's fascinating, actually. It's also scary, though, uh, for me. And I know you're an IT genius, uh, besides being a great lawyer. Um, so, yeah. So, so I, I, I love technology, but I have to say I'm a little bit more conservative compared to Ed and yourself, I would imagine. And most That's other okay. people. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Ed, do you so, have I mean, a question? There's, no, there's so many other types of technologies. I mean, we can talk about blockchain, you know, we can talk about on the edge technology, we can talk about, you know, how people are utilizing different convergence, you know, I mean, a simple thing, let me just get, I want to use this example, right? You know, people that come from Africa, often don't have the formal banking systems, they're living in different countries. But now through things like, uh, you know, payment, uh, mobile payments, through utilizing all of those types of technologies, people are able to support their families because they're able to transact easily. Mm. Thanks to technology, right? You can come, you can, you can work in a specific place. You can send money to your family, which means that, you know, your kids could go to school in that place and that they could buy food. This is how technology is enabling society and people for the better. They, in the world, there's always going to be good and bad. There will oh, always be people that want to use the bad of technology. But the reality is that, like I've said throughout my discussion with you today, the good has always got to outshine, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, it's funny that you started talking a little bit about that. We had another guest is a former IBMer as well, Dr. Sandra Johnson, talking about blockchain and, and uh, global remittance, um, things like that. So it's real, it's real interesting. But I want to change gears a little bit. Um, I'm talking professional and everything. So my question is for you this is a personal question. How long have you been in? How long, long have you been into model trains? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that that is an interesting question. So look, um, one of the other things I do, <laughs> amongst many others, is I love, as I told you, I love sports. So about 20 years ago, I started collecting sports memorabilia. And you can see some of my stuff on the back wall here where I'm sitting. You know, so I've collected a whole lot of sports memorabilia. And then I'm, you know, collecting uh, model trains and vintage toys and uh, retro gaming items, you know, all the way back to, for example, the first ever computer gaming console that was made was called the Odyssey in 1969, you know, and then it went through the different gears of where you had things like the Commodore 64 and the Zeta Spectrum in towards Atari and then now Xbox and PlayStation. So all the way through those ages, right? But model trains, you know, is part of my love. You know, I, I really enjoy it. I, I really love Marklin, 
because I feel that the efficiency of those, uh, you know, engines are unbelievable. And yeah, so all of that forms part of the DNA of Ziad. So do you put your cat, your, your train conductor hat on when you run your trains? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> we gotta get you a conductor hat. <laughs> <laughs> but that is fascinating, Ziad. You know what was beautiful for me today is for you to demonstrate your passion for leadership, the impact that you have, and to take us through your journey. I mean, I didn't realize you were chairman of an organization at the age of twenty. Often people think that you have to advance in age to be able to actually fill in those positions, but just your desire, your drive, your knowledge, your, your curiosity, being a good individual and just showing up can actually advance that and propel you into positions and opportunities open up. And, and as much as you say, we are connected and each one actually helped each one actually move up in the world, but taking ownership for oneself though, and demonstrating the will and the desire, it needs to start with oneself though. You, you're a self-starter. And the message, what what message would you like to land with our with anyone listening? For, um, a corporate leader, I'm going to, as you like to go twofold, to the corporate or institutional leaders out there, as well as youngsters across the globe. What two messages would you like to leave them with, if any? So I'll start with the youngsters. Because okay. that's my passion. <laughs> I so know. I think creating opportunity for the youth, I think youth being true to themselves, I think discipline and uh, the right work ethic is extremely important. You know, prioritizing between play and uh, output is extremely important. I mean, even today we as adults, you know, enjoy a good balanced lifestyle where we want to do our sport and play and do whatever you want, but you can't enjoy all of those things without actually doing your work, which you've got to be good at. So I think getting the right by balance and prioritizing between what you enjoy and what you would actually lead you to the output is extremely important. And be bold, right? Try. Don't be scared to make mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. Don't, uh, you know, continue to make the same mistakes over and over again because that's not good, you know. And by achieving that, I think you're already on to the path of success. And always be, you know respectful but inquisitorial right don't be scared to ask because that's how you learn and there's always people that know more than you you can be at whatever stage in your life you can always learn you can learn from an old man you can learn from a young man you know you can learn from multiple people that have different backgrounds take the good that's out of that so that's my message you know that i would give to the youth um to the leaders that are out there I think really the unification of doing good is extremely important, making sure that we all play in multiple buckets because our responsibility is not only to our individual organizations, we owe a, a great amount to society that has allowed us to develop into who we are. And therefore I think playing across multiple dimensions, sharing of our experience and our learnings, and it doesn't always have to be for reward as you correctly said, right? just by helping other people already is a reward. So coming together, having that unified position of doing good and then building out an objective and making sure like we want to drive corporate success, we drive the objective of what we set out in our multiple other streams. So those would be my messages. Others are beautifully said, actually. Thank you. I love that. Thank you, sir. Um, this was a great. Oh no! I want to ask another question. No, I don't get any more questions. You're I thought fine. you had. I thought you had a question. You're done. No, I'm just teasing. Go ahead, Sharpie. What's your question? <laughs> uh, Ziad, if you had to go back and redo anything in your life, would there be anything you would redo, and why? The answer is no. I tell you why. I'm a person that likes to live my life without regret, right? And I'll, I'll give you a tangible example of this so a year ago when Stephen van Collar called me and said would you mind you know joining us at eoh a true south african company that needs you and that i think you will thrive in you know the thing that really made me decide to leave ibm and to join this is because i don't want to live a life of regret and what resonated with me is here i have an opportunity of going and truly transforming a South African company to be better 
in the next 24 months. And if I don't do that, I'll be sitting in 24 months thinking about or reading about the person that actually did that. And I would never want to be in that position, right? So, you know, going back, you know, I've always tried as best as I could to take advantage of the opportunities, not be scared, back yourself, believe in your application, work with people. And on that basis, always do what's the best thing in those circumstances. And if you live your life by those principles, yes, there might be things of where you've got to do a bit of a trade-off, but that's okay, right? Because at the time, based on those circumstances, you're making the best decision, you got to live with that. That won't give you regrets. Oh, I love that. I think you said so many powerful things, but what stands out for me each time is be confident enough to back yourself to be able to make things happen. Often people are so fearful that they don't take on opportunities and they do live in with regrets. So, so thank you. And I'm going to let you close this one. Oh, Ziad, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been phenomenal yes. on so many levels. So thank I'm you. grateful. So thank, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for thank so much for your time, um, fitting us into your your schedule. We really appreciate it. You landed some amazing points and um, some things. I'm actually going to go back and, and listen to this one again myself. <laughs> um, this was some amazing stuff there. But we really appreciate you, the value as a leader. Um, I said it to someone else. Uh, we need more leaders like you uh, that care um, and really care about our young people because um, they are our future. And if we set them up now for success, our whole society is going to be much better. So this has been another connected you Ubuntu connected conversation. Thank you for joining us in the Ubuntu house. We appreciate you. We love you all. If there's anything that we can do to support you guys out there that are watching and listening, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care, everyone. All the best. Love and light, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.